Hello children, hope you all are doing very good, safe and sound at home. Welcome to another online session. Today we will learn a new chapter in biology, control and coordination. Before we understand what is control and coordination, let us look at the situations where in our day to day life we see a lot of movements exhibited by living organisms or plants. Plants outgrow due to sunshine or animals moving around, running around and uh, children playing in the park or when a bright light has fallen on our eyes, we close, we close our eyes or when we touch a hot object, we retract our hands. All these movements are very in a controlled and it's a, it's a very controlled movement our body exhibits due to the environment changes. So these environment changes are called as stimulus. For these stimuli, our, um, our body or any multi, multicellular organism provides a very controlled movement and this controlled movement is provided by the nervous system in animals and it is a very coordinated system and for this nervous system, the basic unit is a nerve cell and it is called as a nerve neuron. Here you see the structure of a neuron. Dendrite, the cell body has got a nucleus. This is a, the entire thing is a cell. So nucleus we know we have studied in the earlier classes what is the function of a nucleus. It helps in cell division. So here what do we see in the neuron as a dendrite, axon and it has and it ends as a nerve ending. So what is the function of a dendrite? Nerve cells help in control and coordination we know. So how does it receive the information from the environment? It is through sensory organs or sensory organs contain receptors. These receptors are connected to the dendrite that is nerve cell. Dendrites in taken the information from the receptors which is in the form of a chemical that is it sets off it starts a chemical reaction in the cell body to create an electrical impulse this impulse travels through the axon and ends at the nerve ending as a chemical again that is here it sets off another chemical reaction because it is in the form of electrical impulse when it is coming through axon so near the nerve ending the electrical impulse will be converted back to chemical so that it is connected to another nerve cell or a muscle fiber this is how the information from the environment is passed on from one nerve cell or neuron to another neuron or any other cells in the body So what is the function of a dendrite? The information is acquired from the receptors. And where are these receptors? Receptors are present in the sensory organs. When we say sensory organs, we know it is nose, throat, tongue, skin. All the receptors, there are different types of receptors present in these organs. For example, gustatory or receptors are present on the tongue to detect the taste. Olfactory receptors are present in the nose to detect smell and so on. So these receptors get in the signal and through dendrite the signal is entering the neuron which sets off the chemical reaction, converts it into electrical signal or electrical impulse we say and this electrical impulse is passing through axon and ends at the nerve ending. And before the another dendrite starts in the new another neuron we see a gap here, we will see a gap here. That gap is called a synapse. So here axon information travels as an electrical impulse. Nerve ending. In nerve ending what happens? Electrical impulse is converted back to chemical signal. So that dendrites can only take in the chemical signal. Synapse is a gap between the nerve ending and a, another dendrite of the neuron. Here the electrical signal is converted back to chemical signal. Here what do we see is neuromuscular junction. For example, when we touch a hot object, what happens? Here, the neuron is connected to a muscle fiber. We can see that the nerve endings ending at the muscle fiber. What, a, what type of signal is passing through axon? It's an electrical impulse. When it is coming to the nerve ending, it is converted back to chemical. 
and it, through the synaptic vesicles it is passed through the muscle fiber again there is a chemical reaction sets off in the muscle cell and that's how the signal is passed from one cell to and from one neuron to another so therefore nervous system is a network of neurons and our response is based on this neurons the neurons neurons are the ones which is sending the signals from the environment to our body and it is passed how does it taken it is passed from one neuron to another and all these neurons or the nervous system is connected to brain brain and spinal cord form the central nervous system or the cns and they communicate with the different parts of the body through pns that is peripheral nervous system we will look into the brain in the subsequent slides here we we uh, we, uh, we know that there are lot of controlled movements a living organism provide to the environment changes there is something called as reflex action what are what is this when we touch a hot object what happens so when we touch a hot object it we should not take a we should not take a lot of time to respond it should be immediate quick and it should be immediate and quick right so what do we do as soon as we touch the hot object we don't even have a time to think if you think and respond we will burn our hands so there is a natural mechanism in our body called as reflex action and this is performed by a our cns that is central nervous system even before the brain could react the spinal cord which is in the in the root of, which is in the path of signal getting into the brain we have spinal cord this reacts quicker than the brain for particularly for the reflex actions that is receptors are present in the sensory organs they send the signal to the sensory neurons these sensory neurons are connected to spinal cord where the relay neurons collect the information and send it to the motor neurons and then to the effectors effectors are present in the muscles muscle cells and then we immediately retract our hands so they do not wait for the brain to react eventually though the signal is sent to the brain half way through spinal cord reacts quicker therefore we call this path as reflex arc so in as a to summarize what is it you can see the flow chart here the receptor receives a signal from the sensory organs and then send, send it to sensory neurons here you can see the relay neurons collecting the information and from here it is sent to the brain eventually but here what do the relay neurons do they send the signal to the motor neurons and from there to the effectors effectors are present in the muscles and then we respond how do we respond we retract our hands so we call this as reflex arc so what is the reflex reflex action and reflex arc you can go through and we have discussed that cns brain and the spinal cord forms the main part of the control central nervous system and peripheral nervous system peripheral nervous system contains of the cranial nerves whereas central nervous system is our brain which does a complex mechanism of thinking so we are thinking organisms right humans are the only thinking organisms who think a lot to do, to perform any movements or actions so it is a very complex mechanism and the brain is, so brain is a brain is doing a very complex mechanism so it is protected by a strong bony shell called as a cranium or skull and the brain is present in a fluid which absorbs shock any shock it's also called as a shock absorber so there are they are diff they are divided into three main parts fore brain mid brain and hind brain hind brain contains hind brain actually travels through spinal cord or the backbone so what is a fore brain do fore brain has got cerebrum which most of our thinking actions or the voluntary actions are performed by fore brain when we say voluntary actions there are two types of actions or the movements our body or the living organisms respond that is voluntary actions are those which are controlled by us for example clapping our hands walking running the, 
these actions need not need not be performed without our senses that is it can be controlled by us by our choice whether we want to walk or run it depends on us we can stop it right whereas involuntary actions are those which cannot be controlled by us for example breathing blood pressure these are these are the these are some of the involuntary actions so what is the four brain do thinking part of the brain is called as a four brain and it contains cerebrum this cerebrum is divided into many areas performing specific functions we call them as lobes and each lobe is performing a specific function for example controlling the voluntary actions store information center associated with hunger receive sensory impulses and integrate it center associated with hunger is nothing but when we eat food the feeling of fullness or the sense of fullness is associated with particular region in a cerebrum so each lobe performs a specific function and all the voluntary actions are performed here coming to the midbrain midbrain is here so what type of actions midbrain and the hindbrain does it is involuntary functions that is involuntary functions like controlling the size of the pupil when we when we enter a dark room or when we enter a bright very bright room our eye pupil ch changes its size so that is that is not controlled by us it's a natural mechanism and the reflex movements even they are not controlled by us it is a natural mechanism so all those involuntary functions or actions are done by midbrain coming to hindbrain there are three parts in hindbrain cerebellum medulla oblongata and pons what is a cerebellum you see a cerebellum here flower like structure cerebellum this is cerebellum it it does a uh, controlled voluntary actions like walking on a straight line and it gives a and also uh, movements like balancing the body cycling when we are cycling we need a very good balance in the body right so such kind of actions they are controlled voluntary actions not exactly invol involuntary they need a lot of precision practice so those kind of actions are performed by cerebellum coming to medulla oblongata here you see that they end as they end the spinal cord they continue with the spinal cord or the backbone they control involuntary actions like blood pressure salivation and vomiting so salivation when we see when we smell the tasty food we, the tongue salivates it's a very uncontrolled action so it is an involuntary action and then vomiting when an allergic food is taken we throw it up so we cannot control vomiting so these kind of involuntary functions are done by medulla oblongata then pons even they control involuntary actions like regulation of respiration inhalation and exhalation so these are the functions in controlled or done by our brain then we will move on to the control and coordination in plants what do you see in this picture so we can see that this is a very familiar plant called as a touch me not plant commonly called as touch me not it's it's, it's its biological name is mimosa pudica so what happens when we touch a touch me not plant so you can see that half of the plant is still opening and here it, oh, the leaves are opened right and what about this picture the plant is kept in a dark room and only one window is open so you can see that the plant plant is bent towards the sunlight so these kind of movements here the plant is opening the leaves are opened due to touch and here the plant is bent due to sunlight towards sunlight so these kind of movements are the coordination of the plants the controlled movement of the plant is done by is done by the chemicals or the hormones released by the plant they do not have a nervous system like animals but they do have a hormone 
secretion of hormones or chemicals so here when we say movement of plants it is in two ways that is due to growth and independent of growth that is here when a plant is touched is a plant growing here no but there is opening of the leaves there the plant is moving without growth here the plant is growing towards sunlight so this is a movement without growth and this is a movement with growth so these are the two types of movement plants exhibit that is one is due to growth the other is independent of growth the one which is with growth is directional or it is called as tropic that is directional growth is towards which the environment provides stimulus so whether it is a sunlight or a touch or a water the plant is moving towards it or away from it so if it is moving towards the stimulus we call it as a positive and if it is moving away from the stimulus it is negative hence we say plants show tropism in response to other stimuli other stimuli is the environmental stimulus that is a trigger right Envi environment actually provides some kind of trigger for the plants to respond so the tropism is nothing but the directional movement here the plants exhibit four types of movement that is directional movements called as geotropism phototropism chemotropism hydrotropism that is this is due to growth geotropism is nothing but the plants move due to earth's gravity that is we can see that the roots and the stem stem is moving away from the ground that is negative geotropism and the roots are roots are going growing downwards which is positive geotropism phototropism in this picture what do we see is phototropism the plants are bending towards the sunlight it is growing and it is towards the sunlight it is positive phototropism then chemotropism the movement due to chemicals we can see that we can see that the pollen tubes are growing because of the chemicals chemical secretion then hydrotropism this is a movement plant shows due to water if there is a water body like pond or lake the roots are bent towards it we can see that in the subsequent slides Moment independent of growth. Here, thigmotropism we say. This is called as thigmotropism. That is, the plant is responding due to touch. And there is no growth. It, that is why it is independent of growth. So, you can see these pictures which show all the four types of tropism. Here, this is negatively geotropic. That is, the stems are growing away from the earth's gravity. Okay. And here, you can see the tendrils. So what do we see here? We see that the tendril circle around the support. The tendril which is to which is in contact with the support will not grow as fast as the tendril which is away from the support. So this appears as if it is circling around the support or it is growing in such a way that it is circling around the support. This is a thigmotropism. We also see chemotropism where the pollen tube here you see a tube light green color after pollination this pollen tube which is short here will grow towards the ovary this is chemotropism and here you can see that the roots are growing straight when there is no water body around it whereas when there is a water body like upon a lake the roots grow towards the water this is hydrotropism So all the four tropism here in one picture for your reference. So this is phototropism, geotropism, positive and negative is nothing but if the turning of the if the movement of the body is towards the stimulus, it's positive. It's away from the stimulus, it is negative. Stimulus here is here is light, here gravity, here the touch, here it is chemical. Okay, children, we have seen that the moment due to growth or 
independent of the growth from the plant as possible because of the hormones or the chemicals secreted and what are these chemicals they are they are called as plant hormones and the hormones which exhibit growth are growth hormones we have auxins gibberellins and cytokinins growth inhibitors when we say it is to stop so there are hormones which stop the growth and it is essential right the plant cannot keep growing at some point it has to stop so these growth inhibitors stop the growth example is acetic acid and ethylene these two hormones inhib stop the growth of the plant here auxins and gibberellins are present in the stem and which allows the stem to grow cytokinins are uh, help in cell division these are also help in the growth and they are uh, and they help in rapid cell division therefore they are present in seeds and fruits how are these auxins help in the growth so here we see that the auxin molecules are diffused evenly at the tip of the stem when the sunlight falls on it it is evenly dis diffused whereas sunlight is on one direction on one side of the stem you can see that the auxin molecules are moving away moving away and getting accumulated on the other side of the stem where the sunlight is less and this stimulates that part of the stem to grow here that part of the stem is elongated therefore you see that the plant is bending towards the light it appears as if the plant is bent towards the light so similar to plant hormones we animals also have a system called as endocrine system which helps in control and coordination we have seen that nervous system helps in control and coordination of our actions voluntary and involuntary actions there are other actions in the body which requires which requires chemicals or hormones to be secreted in the blood because not all the time or all the actions can depend on electrical impulses so we have endocrine system in the body that is it comprises the glands which secretes hormones to do specific functions why do we need an endocrine system when there is already nervous system which does control and coordination because not all the cells in the body are connected to the nervous tissues uh, sometimes uh, nervous tissue may be uh, nervous tissue need not be required to so, to do particular function or nervous tissues cannot continuously generate electrical impulse so we need another system like endocrine system which does the control and coordination here in our human body we see that these glands secrete hormones and these glands are hypothalamus pituitary parathyroid and thyroid glands adrenal pancreas ovaries and testes ovaries in female and testes in female they help in the reproductive system hypothalamus along with the pituitary glands help to regulate the growth of the body and thyroid glands which are present in the throat they are butter like structures they help in secreting thyroxin hormone adrenal glands help in secreting adrenaline and we will see their functions what is the pituitary gland doing here pituitary glands help in secreting growth hormones so from the name itself we understand that they stimulate growth in the organs so thyroid gland thyroid gland which is present in the throat helps to secrete thyroxin hormone which regulates metabolism for body growth that is how fast the metabolism rate is the digestion rate or the breaking up the molecules of food and how fast it is being absorbed in the body this these are these all come under metabolism therefore thyroxin hormone helps us to regulate the metabolism we have uh, we have seen uh, salt packets saying iodized salt right so iodine is very important for the thyroid glands to secrete thyroxin uh, specific amount of iodine should be present in a in a blood to secrete thyroxin if it is less the person the person may be very fat 
or become obese so obesity also depends on the thyroid glands so there is adrenal glands which secretes adrenaline which prepares the body for the emergency what type of emergency uh, we all do physical activities and which uh, the physical activities which require extensive muscular strength or which needs a extensive workout so for that the body has to be ready for such an activity that is when we do such an physical activity our palpitations are very high that is a heartbeat will be high and we need a lot of oxygen towards the muscles so all these things should take place before that the body should be ready to do that so adrenaline rush does that we call that as an adrenaline rush because once this adrenaline is secreted by the adrenal glands our body is ready for a extensive physical workout next we have pancreas we have heard that diabetic patients are given insulin injections what does it mean the pancreas organ secretes insulin hormone to regulate the blood sugar levels in our body the food that we take as is carbohydrate rich which is got a lot of glucose it, it should be broken down to simpler molecules that can be absorbed by the blood and if it is and this is done by insulin if insulin should be secreted in a specific amount if it is less the blood sugars are not broken down so they stay as blood sugar in the in the blood which affect which uh, creates complications therefore the they are called as diabetic so diabetic patients will be given insulin to keep up the specific amount testes and ovaries testes present in the males and ovaries present in the females help in the secretion of testosterone estrogen and progesterone they they control the growth and development of the male and the female reproductive system okay children so this is about endocrine system both endocrine system and nervous system helps in control and coordination of the body activities and the responses to the environment stimuli thank you children meet you all in the next session